presenting your host for the Racecoin podcast, Jay. What's going on, my Racecoin fans? I'm here with Jeff Siegel. He is someone who has won Le Mans, Sebring, Daytona, and so many other races. And he's the founder of a simulation company called GPX Lab. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So kick it off. I mean, how did you manage to get into racing? And I think if I'm not wrong, you started karting back in 2001. So, you know, what was your motivation behind getting behind the wheel? Um, I grew up around cars. Um, my dad had a passion for cars. Actually, my family was in the automotive industry. So uh, from the time I was probably three or four years old, I could look around at any of the cars on the street and tell you exactly what brand and model they were. Um, and obviously, racing is kind of a natural byproduct of that. So um, growing up watching racing on TV, um, I was super interested in it. Um, and then uh, when I had the opportunity to drive a cart for the first time, actually, it's kind of old by karting standards, but I had wanted to do it for a lot longer. And it was just uh, trying to kick down the barriers and convince my parents to let me do that. Um, then I was completely hooked at that point. So why were there barriers? Like, did they say you were too young? Because I mean, a lot of these people, you know, I've spoken to have like literally been three years old and, you know, <laughs> they're like sitting in a car driving the next thing, you know. So, you know, what kind of barriers did you have to face? Yeah, I mean, I think primarily it was just convincing my mom that it wasn't too dangerous. You know, of all, of all the hobbies that a young kid can be involved with, you know, you have uh, baseball, football, tennis, you know, anything like that. Yeah. Uh, to race cars and, and I think as a parent they look at that and go okay anything but that that sounds quite dangerous um, but eventually kind of wore her down um, my parents uh, got me a, like a backyard go-kart thinking that that would kind of shut me up <laughs> clearly that didn't work eh? yeah the first thing I did was put slick tires on it and remove the roll cage and basically turn it into a race cart that I was using uh, in our driveway and around the streets illegally around our house so <laughs> Very clearly right away which is that the racetrack would be a safer bet yeah i mean of course you you know you have the safety equipment and whatnot so what what age did you manage to finally convince them and then you know start your journey of um getting better and better at driving yeah so actually i think the first time i drove a car i was probably 13 years old um and the first thing that i drove was uh was 125 cc shifter cart so not typically your uh, your best point of entry but it was sort of a sink or swim deal um drove it was completely in over my head i mean that's one of the trickiest fastest carts that you can drive um and and i actually to this day i still keep in touch with the guy that ran the karting school where i first did that and i asked him what was he thinking putting me in a cart <laughs> and uh, what was his response yeah, his response was, you didn't die, and it seems like it worked out okay. <laughs> yeah, you could thank me now. <laughs> exactly. So from that point, um, I really didn't do that much kart racing. I um, had a kart and used it for testing and practice. I probably did under under 10 kart races lifetime um, because I started quite late and had the opportunity to move into cars on the early side. So driving on the track um, in, in various kind of touring and GT-type cars from – 15 started racing them at 16 and then went from there so it definitely wasn't a conventional path to where i am now when you look at the normal junior formula and, and karting scene but uh, seems to have worked out okay so talk us through that transition how did you go from you know just being on the car to being on a real track driving real cars yeah i mean it wasn't such a big transition for me uh, going from a shifter car you know moving to a car things happen much much slower so in that standpoint, you know, it was a lot easier. Um, and I was just on that tipping point of uh, paddle shift transmission. So jumping out of a cart and into a car where you're uh, able to left foot brake and you have a uh, paddle shift, it's really just the way I looked at it was, you know, it was like a video game. Um, so that initial transition was, was quite easy. In the end, then I moved from there into manual transmission cars. So I had a lot of technique that I had to learn uh, and figure out as we went. Um, and that carried me through probably the next three, four years, the first three, four years of my professional racing career. So it was definitely a steep learning curve, um, without that, you know, foundation that most kids have. Uh, but I would say my entire career is kind of a lot like the shifter carding, uh, which was, it was sink or swim, you know, driving a bunch of things that I probably didn't have the background to drive and you either figure it out or you don't. And fortunately I figured it out. So how did you manage to get that opportunity? Because obviously, you know, this is a very expensive sport and, you know, people really struggle to get sponsorship. So how did you manage to get those quick transitions so that you could really, you know, have the opportunity to sink or swim, which most people don't even have? Yeah, I think, I think it was just uh, an honestly primarily a case of uh, being in the right place at the right time. So 
um, when I did my first race in what was the Grand Am Cup at that point in a BMW M3. It was a four-car team. Um, showed up in the first race, uh, qualified quite well. Second race, we were running up at the front. Um, and basically one of my teammates in one of the other cars on the team uh, ended up going GT racing two years later and hired me to be his co-driver. So just being involved in that team without really much expectation or much of a path forward, um, making a good impression on one teammate, and then that put me in a GT car. We had some really good success. We raced together from 2008 until 2012. That was Emil Asentado. So we raced the Mazda RX-8 GT together, um, won the championship, won a bunch of races, uh, and then we raced the Ferrari 458 GT3 together, won a championship in 2012, and that kind of catapulted me onto every other opportunity I've had since then. That is a very quick, <laughs> efficient summary <laughs> of a lot of things. So let's um, let's talk about some of those uh, parts of it. I mean, you know, you've won 24 Hour Le Mans, you've won, you know, Daytona, Sebring, um, the Rolex. There's so many other aspects to, you know, the races that you've won. So let's kind of dive into it. I mean, there's, there's many parts to it. Obviously, you know, there's the training, there's the success, there's um, uh, the kind of, catapulting towards new opportunities as you said so i think i'm going to shoot the question over to you where you tell me what you feel people don't really know about the aspects of winning races and the entire process of all of these things versus what people think it's like and just kind of seeing the champagne being sprayed on your face yeah you know? i mean i think that most of you know most of the successes at least that i've had um, the hard work has been done a long way away from the racetrack and for quite a long time going up to that point. You know, what you see at the track during the actual race, that's really just uh, the end of the job. So to put the opportunities together, to try and find the right people, the right drivers, the right engineers, the right commercial backing, um, having the technical support of the manufacturers. So for me, having uh, at this point a pretty longstanding relationship with Ferrari and a good relationship with Ferrari, um, where that's the manufacturer that I've been uh, tied to and won some of the biggest races with there's a tremendous amount of work to put that together to convince the people that the programs that we had were serious um, you know to gain their trust and their support to be able to operate at a high level and then once you've done it it becomes easier and easier the barriers kind of fall down naturally you have some success and then it's easier to um, be marketable to another team and be a part of that effort but um, just, just a lot more work behind the scenes to, to set it all up. And when you come to the racetrack, you know, okay, it, it doesn't mean that if you haven't done everything to prepare that you can't win. Um, certainly, you know, other people have misfortune, you have good fortune and, and things can turn your way, but that the reality is that all of the work is done well before you get there. And the idea is you, you show up expecting to win. What kind of percentages would you say are, you know, on track versus off track? Uh, the, the on track stuff is 10% maybe of, you know, I think the, the, the bigger picture here. Um, and I think that there are actually a lot of people at a high level that, that don't treat it like that, you know, where they, they arrive and drive. Um, and that works for some people, but that's never been my philosophy. That's never been my mentality. Um, for me, I like to be actively involved with these programs. I like to know everything I can know about the car and about the team and about the, you know, the possibilities and the opportunities in front of us. And I think that gives you the best level of preparation to go into some of these big races and put your best foot forward. Yeah, you've mentioned obviously being part of Ferrari as well and, you know, being associated with them, being a private coach for them. And, you know, these are opportunities that people would die for, you know, they'll chop off an arm and limb for. How did you manage to actually get these things that are, you know, so difficult to get, but almost not only get it, but stay there throughout, you know, many years so that you could actually develop a relationship and, you know, the kind of um, bonds, not only with the company, the team, the people, but also, you know, sustain it. That's the main thing. I mean, what's that saying? Better lucky than good. Um, <laughs> I, I do a lot of driver coaching in addition to the racing. So for yeah. quite a long time, I worked for the Ferrari Corso Pilota program in North America, which is Ferrari's uh, official driving program. So working with Ferrari clients who uh, in many cases have never driven on a racetrack before and, and come to that program to learn how to drive um, very capable street cars faster. From there, some percentage of them decide that they really like the racing thing and they move into the Ferrari Challenge Series. So. I do a lot of driver coaching in that series as well, following a lot of those drivers. Um, some of those drivers then take the jump into GT3 racing or even GTE racing. Um, 
but there's kind of an ecosystem within Ferrari that I've been able to operate in um, and meeting all of these people and being close with the dealers, um, with the North American importer, um, with their best clients, you know, I think that it, it just kind of builds and feeds itself um, and you create good relationships within that brand. So um, I've actually worked with other manufacturers since in 2017, a part of the, uh, the factory Acura NSX team um, as they debuted that car in IMSA. Uh, and that was a great challenge and I had uh, a really good experience there. I learned a tremendous amount there. But at the same time, the relationship with Ferrari didn't go away. It was an opportunity uh, to work with Acura that, that I jumped at. Um, and then at the natural conclusion of that program, um, you know, the foundation that was built with Ferrari is still there. So I kind of find myself gravitating back towards that. Gravitating back to home, just can't, can't leave it. You know, Ferrari just doesn't leave me. <laughs> um, but one of these things that um, is, is obvious is that, um, you know, people have said things like you're a great spokesman, you're a great person in general, you know, you're a heck of a driver, you're someone who has no skeletons on the closet, you're smart. There's so many aspects that people have said about your character, not only, you know, on the track, but off the track as well. So what does it actually take to, sorry? They don't know me very well. <laughs> they just need to dig a little bit deeper. But I mean, jokes aside, so how do you keep a reputation like this, even if it is amazingly fake, you know, to, <laughs> to, keep, it, to keep it real um, with people that are, you know, um, dealing with you? Because obviously the proof is in the pudding of sustaining relationships and, you know, being able to go and mix with more and more people and using the connections you have to expand. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think aside from cash payoffs, that's the easiest way. Um, but I, <laughs> probably owing to the fact that I didn't take a tra traditional route to where I am. So I didn't go through the, the formula car ladder. Um, I find that I've always, either felt like I had to work harder or had to work harder to prove that, you know, that I'm capable of, of doing the same thing that guys that have uh, a long resume from their teenage years have. And I think part of that was to increase my understanding of the off track components of how the race team works and the technical side and, and to have all that. So as a result, I've kind of just necessarily become more thorough in the entire approach. But, but I think the reality is, you know, you just, work hard and do a good job for people and try and be upfront and transparent. Um, that doesn't mean that every deal is going to go well. And that doesn't mean that you're going to have success in every event that you enter. Uh, but at least just having that work ethic where you're not just arriving helmet in hand, expecting everything to be done, but rather trying to integrate with the team and the entire effort um, and be a more active participant in that. And I think that goes a long way. I think uh, at least in my experience, people tend to appreciate that. Of course. I mean, that's, that's a general rule of thumb for any industry, any person that you want to deal with. Right. So that obviously transitioned, you know, this skill set into GPX development lab. Right. So talk us through that journey of how you became a founder of um, the driving simulation in motorsport. Yeah, um, I would say growing up, it was obviously playing playing video games and, and pretty crude simulations, um, which fed my passion for racing. Uh, I never really looked at it as an instructional thing. You know, it was more just a, a way to kill time. Um, but actually, it was an experience that I had in 2014 where I did uh, a handful of races in the FIA World Endurance Championship. So I was going to racetracks that I had never been to before um, on the other side of the globe in many cases. So where there definitely wasn't an opportunity to test or to practice and you'd show up blind, um, sharing the car with two other drivers. So practice time was pretty minimal and you're expected to be on pace right away which is fair. Um, and I actually had a couple of teammates who also hadn't been to the track, also had a similar level of, of experience to me. Mm -hmm. And after the first event, I thought it was kind of curious that they were up to speed right away and I was still kind of finding my feet. Um, and I had this conversation with them about what they were doing. And they said, oh yeah, you know, we went and used a, a proper simulator to learn this track. And these were guys that are based in Europe that's something that is, I don't want to say readily available, but more readily available in Europe. You have a lot of these commercial simulator centers where you can go and you can drive uh, a really good high quality car model on good high quality track models. But the really important part is with the engineering feedback that you would get at a professional level operation to be able to let you know where you stand versus where you should be. Um, that wasn't available in the US. So for me, it was kind of born of a selfish necessity to want this and to look at it and go, okay, well, this is something that's missing from our market. Um, I looked around at the various simulators that were available and the offerings that were there and ended up hooking up with Darren Turner's operation based performance simulators out of the UK. Um, and we purchased a simulator from them 
part of that is we also have a technical relationship with them as well. So we're able to work with them on car models and track models. Um, and that's been four years ago since we started this operation in the U.S. Uh, with the support of Darren's group. And now we've kind of found our feet and grown on our own. And we still work with, uh, with the guys at base, but we do a lot of our own stuff as well, building our own car models and our own circuit models and kind of tailoring our offering. Um, because I think that a lot of the simulation is geared towards professional drivers. And certainly that's where I started looking at it. You look at Formula One and IndyCar um, and top levels of sports car racing, you have the big factory teams are the ones that have their drivers preparing for an event on a simulator. And my outlook is that's great and that's really helpful. But if it's helpful for a professional driver. And why is it not helpful for everyone, right? Yeah, exactly. You'd think it would be infinitely more helpful for a gentleman driver who doesn't have the ability to be on the track constantly. Um, so that's been our offering was initially geared towards amateur drivers, aspiring pro drivers, gentlemen drivers. And certainly we have uh, a mix of professional drivers as well, but to kind of tailor the operation towards the people who need the track time, who can find seconds of improvement instead of tenths or hundreds of a second. So here's the two part question as a follow up to that. What is the biggest difference between a simulator right um and the real thing and the second part is how much of a difference does it really make because obviously you know someone who wants to um trial it out and you know use the service wants to know is it really going to make that much of a difference to my my driving time well uh the, the first part is i think the biggest difference um whether people are willing to admit it or not is just that there are no consequences to crashing in the simulator so your entire outlook changes, your entire philosophy changes. And one of the things that, that we really go to great lengths to try and, and push on the drivers that come to our simulator, especially in the first session or two, is what you get out of this will be what you put into it. It's okay if you crash. It's an odd driving experience. It takes a little bit of time to get comfortable driving a simulator that doesn't feel and behave exactly like your real car. You know, no matter how hard we try, it will never be an exact replica of the real car. If somebody crashes once or twice, it's not the end of the world. It happens. If somebody crashes 10 times in the first five laps, then we sort of point out that it'd be very unlikely that they would do that in real life and that they would be much better served to operate with the mentality that they have in real life. That is to say, starting conservative and working your way faster and faster up to speed. So um, the people that treat it properly get a really beneficial result. Um, those that treat it more like a game, then the benefit is more like that of a game but i think it can be really really helpful um again selfishly so set up this business and I have a lot of clients that that use it um but for me i used it in preparation for le mans for the first time that i raced at le mans in 2015 and one of the really interesting things that i was able to do was to get a reference lap from the previous year from jimmy bruni um, i want to say that they won the race in 2014 so we had one of the fastest laps of the weekend on data so to be able to study his data lab and look initially at things like what gear is he using and you know where is he braking and things like that. But then after driving the simulator and really learning the track in our car model of the 458 GTE, then to overlay my lap with his actual real life data and start to try and emulate that driving style, which is not my driving style. It's not typically how I would do it, but you really start to understand why other people's mindsets and how they're driving, right? Exactly. And, you know, certainly if, if you give somebody enough laps at Le Mans, they can develop their own style and make it work. Um, but that's a track where you can't test. It's not a permanent circuit. Uh, the track time is really precious. And, you know, there's a lot of things that need to happen. So to show up there and already have gone through that process of vetting my ideas versus what actually works and to know exactly what I needed to try and do was extremely helpful. And as a rookie, I felt like I'd already been, already been there once or twice already. You know, the three of us in our car that year, myself, Townsend Bell, and Bill Swedler, we were all rookies, but, you know, I was like the veteran of the car because I, I knew what I was looking for already from the very first session. Hmm. I mean, it, it sounds like, um, you know, pressing uh, A on a PlayStation isn't, isn't, you know, good enough, but, you know, you really got to get into that simulator where you manage to not just get a flying car that just kind of magically drops and then you're just off again kind of thing, but you really use it as a, as a method of, um, practicing as though you don't want to crash and you don't want to die and you're actually trying to you know do your best lap time I mean it completely makes sense so there's a to and fro with it but it sounds like you have the coaching the racing simulation business you have your own races you have your own training 
what's going on like where's where's all this time coming from do you have like a extra bernard's watch like <laughs> how are you splitting your time between all these things because obviously it seems like there's a lot on your plate yeah i mean there's definitely a lot in play but i prefer it like that i would rather be busy than uh than have a minute where i have a chance to feel bored or feel like i'm not doing something so um you know there are times where it's a little bit hectic um typically the month of june is completely crazy um because it's a very popular month for racing happens to be the biggest race of the year for me when I'm a part of it at the 24 hours of Le Mans, um, which is a big time suck, if nothing else. Um, but really to be surrounded with good people, you know, like I said, you do a lot of the legwork in advance. So the preparation for not just my racing, but for the coaching with other teams and for the simulator business, all of that happens in the part of the season when it's typically more quiet and a bit dead. Um, and if you do your homework and you prepare everything properly, then kind of like in the race, you just executing at that point becomes much easier yeah it sounds like uh you've had opportunities you've taken them you've made the best of it you've had your work ethic and to be honest you know you've lived um in in a way that a lot of people would love to have the same opportunities you have so um as a kind of final question what i wanted to know is how can you in you know maybe like a summary say a few things about your journey that would help uh, people understand do you know what if I do these things or if I work on these things or if I focus on these specific um, things whether that's you know choosing a specific um, country or how do I find a good team or how do I find a good co-driver or how do I improve my skill set or how do I develop a discipline and a work ethic that I can actually do these things how can I actually have my vision open so that if a business opportunity comes my way I can actually do something about it so you know there's a lot of aspects to this but I mean, in a short summary, what can you say to people to really help them, you know, be able to have the same opportunities that you have had, you know, if the luck also plays in their favor? Well, they've got to wait for me to be ready to stop. And then, you know, and then we can... <laughs> I guess humbling is crossed off the list. <laughs> um, no, all kidding aside, I think that the really important thing that served me very well has been uh, to have goals and not just big goals that, you know, are sort of lifetime goals that you're really chasing after, but um, to lay out short and medium term goals as well. So not just to go blindly into a season and hope that you win the championship, but what are you trying to win a championship for? Where are you trying to go and how are you trying to get there? So for me, one of my major career goals uh, for quite a long time was to compete at 24 hours of Le Mans. That's a complicated thing to do. It didn't just happen. I didn't just stumble into that one. But for a lot of years, everything was geared towards that. Okay, in the short term, you're trying to be the fastest driver on track on any given lap. You're trying to have good race results. You're trying to finish well in the championship classification. Um, but for me, it was working towards that goal. So to try and put yourself in a position where you can interact with the people that are going to be necessary to do that, the co-drivers, the sponsors, the teams, the manufacturers, to make sure that you're ready if that opportunity should arise. So for me, it's always to have those goals and to have a plan. And then just to execute on that plan. That doesn't mean it's always going to go your way, but it's not, it's not something that just happens uh, blindly. You know, I think that there's a lot of planning that can be involved and that's always what served me very well. I think one last point about this um, that I think would benefit people is the work ethic part, the discipline part, the, the part that, you know, is mainly unspoken because it's just um, for some people, it just seems like they have it and, you know, they just basically are able to focus and concentrate and do things and get things done. And, you know, be in a mindset where I just want to make sure that I um, execute this daily. Whereas some other people are in a situation where it's not as easy for them to, you know, it's like they want to, you know, they, they, they really do want to do these things. They really do want to, you know, call the extra 10th sponsor, you know, but by the ninth one, they're so disheartened that, you know what, like maybe I should call it a day today. Yeah. No, and, and, you know, that's one of the interesting things about the simulators. We see a lot of young drivers coming through there and you get to a pair of, you compare the approaches. So, um, you know, I think, I think that there are a lot of really naturally talented drivers out there. There are a lot of drivers that have the skills and the speed, um, but you watch them and even just in a little snapshot of the simulator that don't necessarily have the work ethic. Um, if they struggle, they switch off right away. And I don't, I don't mean finding a sponsor or finding an opportunity, but I mean, if they struggle in a corner, they tend to just give up. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's really important in this industry because there are so many people who would kill to have the opportunities that we have to drive the cars that we have who would do it, um, you know, in many cases to pay to do what other people are paid to do. 
So obviously that turns into a very cutthroat industry. And I think that the only way that you can differentiate yourself as a driver besides being fast, and there are plenty of very fast drivers, would be to have that work ethic and to go that extra distance. So, um, you know, I think that that's, it's not just an, you know, an important advantage. I think it's a critical part of just being successful. In the first and place. how does one develop that on a, you know, on a daily basis, on a small basis, on a weekly basis, on a, you know, a monthly basis? I mean, ultimately it all boils down to how badly you want it. Right. Um, you know, if you're willing to make the sacrifice, whether it's uh, time, whether it's the, the physical training, whether it's the lifestyle choices of going out and partying with your friends or making sure that you're ready for the race that's coming the next week, you know, all of these things feed it. And I think that, you know, there are plenty of professional drivers who don't have that level of dedication. And there are plenty of drivers that have never made it that have more than enough of that dedication. So um, what's that saying that uh, hard work guarantees you nothing, but not working hard definitely guarantees you something. Mm. I think on that quote, we're going to leave it there. And uh, thank you for an amazing, um, you know, explanation and that motivation to actually help people see the truth, because I don't feel like you lied there. It was very much, you know, you can work hard and still not get it. But if you don't work hard, you're really not going to get anything. So, you know, it's, it's definitely the truth. And uh, thank you for sharing that. Thanks very much for having me on. If you like this episode of the Racecoin podcast, go ahead and subscribe so you can get notified every Monday when a new episode is out. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter.